Hare Krishna. So these are two questions we'll be discussing today. Can a rational person be spiritual and how can science and spirituality go together? Now at one level, today's session might, this topic might seem very preliminary. Many times uh, the, we talk about, say, the existence of the soul and the existence of God as introductory topics in the in maybe our classes whenever they are held if we join some course the journey of self discovery or whatever course we might be joining initially in the flow of the gita the gita was spoken in a culture where the existence of god was never a debated question at least for the audience that the Gita was spoken to. Krishna was speaking to Arjuna. But there, there was no question about that. That's why in the Gita's flow itself, there, is no, there are no direct references to establish the existence of God. There is some reasoning given to establish the existence of the soul because that question was pertinent to Arjuna's, that subject was pertinent to Arjuna's immediate concern. That was how can I kill my loved ones? So one part of the answer was that actually their souls are eternal. So you're not actually killing them. However, the existence of God itself is not an issue relevant to the immediate subject of the Gita or the immediate, the original audience of the Gita. So we will, today what we'll be discussing is not so much an existence of God. It is more an idea of how rational, how rationality and spirituality can go together. And since a major output of rationality is science, so we'll talk in extension about how, uh, when we are studying the Bhagavad Gita, how can we be both scientific and spiritual? So the words we'll be discussing is 7-7. Seven, seven. Mattaha parataram nanyat kinchidasti dhananjaya mai sarvamidam protam sutre mani ganaiva. So, Mattaha parataram nanyat. That there is no truth other than me. Kinchid asti dhananjaya. Mai sarvamidam protam sutre mani ganaiva. That just as. Uh, <coughs> Thread underlies and unifies all the pearls that comprise a necklace. So similarly, there is the divine, the ultimate reality, Krishna, who underlies and uh, permeates everything. Now, Mattaha Parataram Nanyat. Now, this is a very... Parataram can mean higher or other, both, para. So there is no truth higher than me. There is no truth other than me. Of course, no truth is other than higher than me. So this actually gives a very fundamental understanding of God itself, which will be important for us to explore, to discuss this topic further. But this is, so the idea is that the pearls are visible. The thread is not so easily visible. Like that, in nature, we see many extraordinary manifestations that are visible. But what is underlying is not so easily visible. So let's look at what we'll be discussing. Three parts today. How rationality points to something more. And then we'll talk about three levels. Rational, irrational, and transrational. And then how science and spirituality can work together. So... Now, rationality points to rea a reality beyond rationality. How does that work out? So, firstly, let, let's, look, let's look at what we mean by the word rationality. So, rationality is something which is reasonable, something which is logical. So, where when we human beings function in the world, we have broadly two aspects to our functioning. There is, there is our beliefs, our conceptions, and then there is behavior, our actions. So our conceptions and actions of beliefs or behaviors. So how we take in the world and how we act in the world. These two are, are primary parameters which, uh, which uh, shape our interaction with the world. 
Now, if both of these are guided by reason, by logic, then that is said to be that that body of looking at the world, of interacting with the world, is called as rationality. And uh, the generally the opposite of rationality is irrationality. But now, when we talk about rationality, science is when, say, for example, now we have a pandemic going on. So when the Black Plague was going on in Europe several hundred years ago, at that time, there was an explanation that maybe it's caused by some evil spirits. It's, and some people thought the spirits were possessing cats and from cats they were coming to humans or some people thought later or it's, it's with rats or whatever. But there are evil spirits. Now that kind of explanation is when science uses the word rational, it uses it usually equates the word natural. Natural means nat it refers to material nature. So if there are some beings like that, science can't study them. So science rejects that kind of explanation and says, so let's find out what actually causes this. And that's how we come up with the, uh, the study of germs. And then there is a discovery. So rational explanations focus on the, uh, they were work on the idea that this world, when we want to look for explanations in this world, we look for physical or phen either empirical observations or something that can be reasonably inferred from empirical observations. So that is the idea of rationality. Now, while that is good and science has made tremendous advancement using rational understanding, but let's, there are some, there are some questions which rationality can't answer. And the first question that rationality can't answer is why does rationality work at all? Why should the universe be rational? Why should it be orderly? Why should it work in a way that is logical and reasonable? So if we accept a atheistic way of looking at the world, if the world is the result of unguided subatomic particles, then why should such particles have ever organized themselves in ways that are rationally intelligible? And not only that, let's say to understand this, why should our mind, which too is supposed to be a product of unguided natural forces, be structured to work according to reason? So the idea over here is that in the world outside, say for example, Newton saw apple falling and he came up with the equation F is equal to gm1 m2 upon r square. Now why would, why should the falling of objects follow certain rules? And now if you consider, there are mathematical constructs. So math is basically, does math actually exist in nature? We could say mathematical operations like addition, subtraction ex exist in nature. But the, the mathematical con conceptions like say, hmm, imaginary numbers or integral calculus, do they exist actually in nature? Well, they don't, then why does the working of nature correlate with them? So if math is something which we have thought up with our minds and nature is out there and both of them are unguided, both of them have resulted from unguided forces, then why should, why should there be any correlation between what we think up with our mind and how the world actually works? So this is a mystery that many mainstream scientists have pondered. So we have, Jean Wigner, a Nobel laureate, he says that the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. We should be grateful for it and hope that it will remain valid in future research and that it will extend for the better or for worse to our pleasure, even though perhaps also to our bafflement. So, this might seem a little mouthful of a quote, but it's simple enough. Why does math work? So this is a question for which reason itself has no answer. If we consider the evolutionary worldview, then all living beings are geared for survival. Nature is an arena where everybody struggles for survival. So we are simply biological robots that are 
uh, that are geared for survival and reproduction primarily then why should we even have the ability to think in rationally in terms of mathematics to think abstractly in terms of uh, life's ultimate questions oh. why if newton is was also simply a product of unguided evolution why when the apple fell he didn't pick it up and just eat it and go away if he were simply a biological robot geared for survival and reproduction he could just have eaten the apple that's that's all why think of anything more and so why should our minds be uh, capable of math at all and more importantly why should nature work according to math so now math is considered to be foundational to rationality as it is conceived by science and especially as it is expressed through mathematical equations so here the point is that rationality works but rationality has no explanation why it works with the, if we just stick only to rationality in terms of logic and logic as is defined or utilized in modern science and for everything natural we want to find a natural explanation then within nature within material nature there is no explanation why material nature should organize itself according to rational principles that work according to mathematical laws or why our minds should be capable of rational thinking expressible in mathematical terms so that the point here is not that ration, we, we reject rationality or we limit rationality but we recognize that rationality itself requires an explanation so now god and rationality or god or reason how do they relate with each other so god is not an explanation for the unexplainable he is the explanation for explainability now one of the famous one of the common atheistic tropes against god is that in the past people thought that oh they didn't know how rains fall so they attributed that rains fell because of some gods and they tried to worship those gods or in the past people didn't know how diseases occurred so they imagine that there are some spirits over there and they try to appease those spirits so basically the idea is that the in the universe there are many things that are, were unexplainable and primitive people or pre scientific people came up with the idea of god as a explanation for the unexplainable and even now some religious people might uh, use that kind of strategy for proving you know oh science doesn't know this science doesn't know that and therefore we need god but that is not the mood of the bhagavad gita see Uh, the bhagavad gita talks about how maya dakshina prakriti suyate sa characharam that the universe works under the supervision of the divine what that means is uh, god is not the explanation for the unexplainable it is the explanation for explainability explainability means why are things explainable at all why should falling objects fo uh, follow a particular mathematical mathematical formula that we have codified as newton's equation newton's uh, gravitational equation why should matter and uh, energy be interchangeable in a particular way as is codified by einstein's e is equal to mc square so now why do these equations actually work so it's very important that if we start presenting god as oh, because science can't explain this therefore we need god no science can explain this because there is god this is god of the gaps is a often a common atheistic argument that god of the gaps means that there are some gaps in scientific understanding and god fills up those gaps and their idea is that as those gaps can get filled up with scientific understanding then god will have no space to live so god what the bhagavad gita gives us a vision is not god of the gaps that but god who underlies everything including the gaps 
So what we can understand, we understand by the grace of God. And what we don't understand, or no, sorry, what we can understand, that is understandable. Why is it understandable at all? That understandability itself manifests some higher intelligence. So, who underlies everything, including the gaps. Now, moving forward. So, this is the idea of God as thread in the necklace, which we started with the metaphor, we started the discussion over here. God is the thread in the necklace of the world. Now, what this means is, it's, 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 this is a very foundational understanding. See, we may sometimes think of, say, I exist here, and then another being person exists there, another person exists there. Now, sometimes God may be conceived of in this way, and you know, there's a hierarchy, and God exists at the top of the hierarchy. So, uh, now, in, in common parlance, we might use it like that. Okay, so, you know, you have, you have your head of your district, and then, then, then we have a head of the state, then we have the head of the country. Maybe there is an empire spanning the world, you would have the emperor of the world. But then, beyond all such people, the topmost is God. Yes, that is one way of looking at God. But that is only a partial understanding of God. God does not exist merely at the top of a hierarchy. God is not the best, just the best of all beings. God is the basis of all being. God is the basis of all being means nothing would exist without God. God is the existence who makes all existence possible. So now if I just look at the necklace and keep examining the pearls, I may not find the thread at all. Now, now we can have super fine with, with advanced technology. We can have pearls, nec necklaces made in such a way, super fine. And all the pearls are so close together that we might never not even notice that there is a thread over there. But the thread is essential for the existence of the necklace. Without the thread, the necklace wouldn't exist. So if we look at it in this way, then and some people ask, if God created everything, who created God? That, and that many atheists claim that this is a question which is a knockout. But actually, it's, it's not a knockout question. It's a question that expresses one's ignorance. Why is that? Asking who created God is like asking what made a who made a circle circular. Well, nobody made a circle circular. Circle by definition is circular. So similarly, the very definition of God is in 1039, Krishna says that, that with the, he, God is the existence without whom no existence would be possible. He is the existence that underlies all existence. He is the cause of all causes. Now, uh, you may say, but what does that mean practically? Every school of knowledge or every field of knowledge begins with some definitions. So and let's take another example to simplify this point of definition. Suppose somebody reads, say, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And then, say, a child reads that book and is intrigued by it. And reads about all the characters over there. And then at the end, as maybe a friend tells, you know, J.K. Rowling is a very good writer. Oh, who is J.K. Rowling? Oh, J.K. Rowling is the writer of the book. Oh, really? And the child starts reading the book. And I don't, I don't find any J.K. Rowling in the, in the book. Well, J.K. Rowling is not in the book. No, she made the timeline. She made the storyline. She create. She made the character. She made the, um, she made a brought about the interaction, the dialogue, the setting, everything. But she exists outside. So no matter how exhaustively somebody may study study uh, the, the Harry Potter novels, they're not going to find J.K. Rowling as a character over there. So similarly, God does not exist in nature. You know, God is not like an undiscovered satellite around Jupiter. We just need to find the right instruments and we'll find God. 
no god exists outside the domain of time and space when we ask who created god that question itself indicates that or that question presumes that god exists within time so god is not created by time rather god creates time and god creates through time so god exists outside the domain of time but so here is why is this important to understand because we especially we will be later talking about the personal and uh, impersonal conceptions of the divine also later but the point is especially when we we worship a personal conception say we have of god when we see to a temple and we look at a image a deity of god then by looking at the deities if we might get a conception that god is just one person like all of us yeah okay he is different he is powerful much more powerful but he is just a person like us no god is exists in a different category of being so so god is the existence who makes all existence possible god we all exist in the time domain but god exists outside the time domain that's why the question who created god is itself irrational is 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 a irrational question because it presumes certain things which are not true what does it presume that god exists within time that god is a creator within time god is neither a creature within time nor a creator within time god exists outside the time just like jk rowling exists outside the harry potter novels so <clears throat> let's move on now so again to reinforce the same point that god and how how do we look at god and science god is not an explanatory alternative to science he is the explanatory foundation the reason that for all explanations that means the more science advances and the more science ca- comes up with astonishing findings about the nature of reality the more our our conviction our god's existence and brilliance can increase now nowadays we may get impressed by seeing how fast not just computers work even our phones work now today in ordinary phone that we have in our hands you now we have more processing power in a phone today than maybe all the computers in the world had in the 1960s so we may say oh science is so brilliant uh, technology is so brilliant yes it is however technology functions based on certain principles like the semiconductor effect the semiconductor effect was not created by science it was tapped by science so we appreciate that uh, tapping of it through technology and we appreciate the brilliance of the scientists and researchers who are doing that but at the same time we recognize that uh, the foundational realities if there were no semiconductor effect there would be no telecommunications at all uh there will be no microchips possible nothing and all the genre of electronics and telecommunications would not be possible and we did not create that now why should now some elements are conductors they say for example all electric current, current to pass through them easily so if somebody is getting an electric shock now we are told that don't touch them they should find something say which is insulator like wood or something to touch not touch something like a metal so the idea is that uh, why because certain elements are conductors certain are insulators now why should something be in between semiconductors well we may say oh because you know the bonding of the within the atoms is not that strong okay whatever that is not explanation see that is a that is a okay there is a difference between uh, how something works and why something exists so why should the semiconductor exist effect exist at all why should all elements not be conductors and insulators so technology doesn't technological advancement doesn't in any way challenge god's existence because god is not an explanatory alternative to science or technology he is a explanatory foundation now this takes us to the next part 
this is a huge subject actually science and spirituality come on yeah, so now we move to the next part is rational irrational and transrational so we could have these three levels rational is where we normally operate now irrational is where somebody acts and somebody makes some say while we are discussing something with someone they just make some illogical arguments and that means it's not based on reasoning it's based on half co half co logic or whatever so the irrational is that which can't stand rational scrutiny whereas the transrational is that before which rationality finds itself inadequate what do we mean by that why would rationality find itself inadequate because you know, we humans are rash we are we are there are realities beyond the rational so what is a transnational reality so for example why does rationality work within an atheistic world view there is no rationale for why rationality should work there is no reason why reason should work why should things be logical you know some some say um let's take this from another perspective that atheists sometimes uh, uh make fun of some religion religious people saying that oh you follow so many rituals and superstition that these don't make any sense these don't make any sense now of course there are many superstitions which don't make sense not everything that is followed in traditions is valid but okay you are so concerned about whether things make sense or not but then what is the end result of the rational world view a rational rationality if if a rationalistic world view is necessarily said to be non theistic now it is not but that is a presumption now if you are rational how can you believe in stuff like god and soul and all this stuff okay let's let's assume there is it's not a proven conclusion that rationality has to lead to atheism but let's material let's presume it does so but then what happens is rationality tries to figure out okay you now why does this uh, apple fall down this way or why do why does how does electricity flow through certain elements or why do such cosmic phenomena happen in this particular way so through rationality we try to find out how various aspects of the universe make sense but then within the rational world view what happens is okay why does the universe exist itself that makes no sense at all you know oh it's just a cosmic accident right we are existing and we live for some time and we die in fact uh, a, phys- a prominent atheist physicist said that uh, steven we- uh, <coughs> steven weinberg said that the more the universe becomes comprehensible the more it seems pointless the more the universe becomes more comprehensible the more it seems pointless now what does that mean that means what he's saying is that the more we start making sense okay this is how this works this is how that works that is how that works but you know what is the meaning of the whole universe oh it has no meaning so that just doesn't make any sense it's like suppose we discover some ancient script maybe some they dig and dig some part of india or egypt or china they find some wall underground and there's an ancient script and then we start saying oh, okay you know this this shape means this letter that shape means that letter this combination means this word and this word means this so now we decipher the whole script and the individual words make sense but the whole message doesn't make sense like every every mark is meaningful the words are mean letters are meaningful the words are meaningful but the message is not meaningful so what what's going on here so that is the result of the atheistic world view of the even when we take rationality as the sole basis of knowledge and we equate it with atheism then why does the universe oh this makes sense that makes sense that makes sense and by scientific research we'll discover more of what makes sense and why things work the way they do but the universe it doesn't make sense we just exist and we die and the life has no meaning 
really so it's like we are struggling to find small islands of meaning while drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness we are struggling to find islands of meaning while drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness so transrational that that which before which rationality itself finds itself inadequate that means the transrational is where each one of us actually finds uh, that what we can see of rationality okay why does rationality work and what is the meaning of all this existence so is there something called trans transrational that is where the idea of miracles comes into the picture so miracles are not against science they are above science what do you mean by above science let's consider the example now we have say one famous miracle in the bhakti tradition that is of krishna lifting over than now somebody might say a, rational, a purely rationalist person might say that um, or a devotee of rationality might say that how could somebody be um, able to do something like this how can somebody lift it yes normally it's not possible to anyone to lift, for anyone to lift it but there is something else going on over here so how does krishna find the center of gravity of govardhan to lift it say for example if you have to lift something say if, even if i have to lift a phone just lifting it one finger i need to find the exact center if it's my finger is anywhere else it will just fall off so how did krishna find the center of gravity of govardhan well krishna didn't have to find a center of gravity because he is the source of gravity the source of gravity that means what science calls as the laws of nature Uh, when we talk about miracles what do we mean by miracles now uh, different people may have different understanding of what miracles are and not all miracles are true here we are not talking about the whether specific miracles are true or not but we are talking about the principle of whether miracles are possible or not miracles means that where the normal laws of nature are temporarily suspended how might they be suspended say for example krishna has got nature to work according to the say the law of gravity but when krishna wants he suspends that law why why he suspend that law for the reciprocation of love with his devotees so that's what he is going on over here that actually uh, miracles we do not reject science we do not uh, reject that I mean, that means we don't we acknowledge fully that the world works rationally but we understand that rationality is not the ultimate reality we understand that there is a divinity beyond rationality and on special occasions within the history of the universe that divinity might intervene and then the rationally deciphered or rationally comprehended laws of the universe might be suspended on a few occasions so spirituality doesn't re reject rationality but spiritually doesn't restrict humanity to rationality humanity means we are talking about we understand that there is more than rationality also within the within the um, existence now this is not just within existence it is within human nature also now sometimes say we all may have heard of stories of say times when say a family is caught in an accident and maybe a big car has crushed a smaller vehicle and then there is a child inside that car and then the mother or the father they just rush over there they somehow get some superhuman surge of strength and they push aside the car now how does this happen now normally they might not be able to do anything like that but and no if it will be a pure rationality they wouldn't even try it hey that i can't do it Uh, but what happens is that when say for example the twin towers were falling and some of the fire fighters went inside now they knew that the twin towers went to twin towers were burning 
uh, they knew that towers might collapse and if they collapse they would die but they went in why did they go in because you know if it was if they were simply biological machines uh, driven by the urge for survival well, from a rational perspective hey why should i risk my life for someone else but such an act we don't consider it as stupid of course, we consider it as heroic of course one shouldn't be foolhardy and where the where death is certain we don't go in over there but the point is when somebody risk one's own life to save somebody else's life we consider that noble so human actions need to be rational but we can't restrict humanity to rationality alone now we need we have some of the most noble actions that humans do some of the most inspiring things that people do are not because of not when they are simply governed by rational rational thinking it is inspirational it is based on some higher values so reality so there's trans rational aspect to reality and then now the last part how science and spirituality can work together so broadly speaking science is the study of matter spirituality is the study of what matters so uh, what do we mean study of matter science studies let's look at this yeah so study of matter improves our capacity to control the outer world so as i said earlier that what does science do science looks at material objects and tries to understand how they interact with each other and by that analysis and understanding we improve our capacity to control the world outside so by understanding how tech, how say the laws of gravity or the laws of thermodynamics or, or other such laws we can better develop technology and through that we control the world and this has led to some phenomenal successes however science itself can't provide us answers of about study of what matters what matters means what is more important what is less important how do we decide this that science can't tell us by itself it is study of what matters helps us make better choices it brings value to our life it makes us better human beings now what do i mean by study of what matters over here uh, in the mainstream media we often hear about how there is so much violence that is triggered because of religious extremism and yes it is true unfortunately but you know, extremism is is just a human mentality and that extremism as a mentality can use can use or abuse religion and extremism as a mentality can use and abuse science also now most of us probably have not heard that at at his times hitler's germany was among the most scientifically advanced and hitler tried to create his vision of reality he tried to justify his nazism nazism uh, by Uh, by science in fact uh, now this is not again to blame science at all it is to it is to illustrate this point that the study of matter and the study of what matters are two separate things and science doesn't tell us what matters now what do i mean by this <clears throat> uh, hitler's autobiography min kampf it is my struggle now it was uh, a direct derivation from darwin's idea of the struggle for existence in fact there are books written about this from darwin to hitler now it is not that darwin in evolution necessarily has to lead to uh, to nazis uh, to hitler's kind of mentality but there was a path that led there just like religion doesn't have to lead to extremism sometimes religion leads to extremism so so what was this path that uh, nazi germany uh, traced it was that 
just as within nature there is a struggle for existence and any species that is unfit that members of a species or even entire species they can become uh, they can, they'll be killed and they will become extinct if they are not fit to survive in the struggle of existence so it was not just uh, so hitler's germany at that time took this idea and made it into a governmental policy based on an idea based on a based on a now discredited idea called social darwinism social darwinism was that that different races in humanity are also in a stage of struggle and evolution and hitler had the idea that the nazis we are the descendants of what he consider what of the so called aryans and these aryans had traveled across the world and created civilization across the world and he thought we being the descendants of those aryans we will again create a fresh civilization in the world so based on that analysis he felt that the nazis are the fittest to survive and he decided who all are unfit for example he decided that uh, first he started and this was official policy by which say anybody who is uh, say uh, uh what we today call as people with special needs at that time they could be called as mentally retarded or physically handicapped uh he says all such people were firstly they are all forcibly sterilized that you know they should not reproduce because if they reproduce they'll they'll create that more and more and more then after that he decided that these gypsies you know they are also a primitive race and his idea was that actually nature will anyway eliminate these people so we we can help nature along the way we can help so then he had gypsies were then after that he reinterpreted history in such a way he said the jews are a, a scourge on humanity and the jews should need to be eliminated for the elimination of hum, human for the the elimination of jews will lead to the evolution of humanity and especially the evolution of the nazis who are meant to be at the top of the hierarchy of races within humanity and thus there was a holocaust now these programs of forced sterilization forced segregation these were not just one or two or a few hundred there are thousands not just a few thousands also millions or oh, that is a the area the area of research was called as eugenics eugenics means that we try to scientifically manipulate the genetic pool of humanity so that a superhuman race or a the race of the best humans will emerge so at that time this was justified using science and this was implemented using science now we recoil at the idea of say or killing someone just because they are deficient in some ways but now now many scientists also at that time recoiled against those ideas but there was nothing within their science which would make them recoil see from a scientific perspective uh, there is no intrinsic worth to human life or for that matter any life at all but let's stick to human life right now there is no intrinsic worth to human life from a scientific perspective why not because we are just biological robots so now we all feel a sense of horror when any human being is killed and especially if a ideology is rationalized to kill thousands of kill human beings in large number but where does this revulsion come from the, the idea of the sanctity of human life is not is not rationally inferable from any scientific theory so the study of what matters that is something which is vital for us to make decisions in life uh, einstein himself said that we can talk about the scientific found they, we can talk about the ethical foundations of science but we ta can't talk about the scientific foundation of ethics that means what is that we can discuss you know is science being used ethically or unethically but 
can science itself develop the ethical instinct within people no now now this is not to say that science scientists are not ethical this is a very this is a very clear point i want to make that scientists many scientists may be very uh, maybe maybe and are very principled very ethical but there is nothing within the purely naturalistic study of science study as this done by science to bring about that ethical to bring about that ethical sense so study of what matters that is spirituality the spirituality uses a overall sense of reality and by that overall sense of reality why does why does life have its sanctity the spirituality tells us that you know the nature has its sanctity because nature is a manifestation of god's grace life has sense sanctity because every life is a spark of the divine and that vision of sanctity comes from spirituality so so when we we have a proper understanding of what matters it helps us make better choices it helps us to see our life as valuable and ultimately helps us to become better human beings so science makes things better spirituality makes people better science can give us better control over the outer world so that we can have better things better gadgets but spirituality can help us to understand what matters clearly so oh, our values get defined and refined by spiritual growth and then by that we can actually become better human beings so now everybody has a certain understanding of what matters for a terror uh, for for hitler what mattered was you know creating a new human or uh, new phase in human history by eliminating all those who we thought were obstacles so his hierarchy is were inverted and perverted so the values that we have the those values need to be refined and defined uh, defined and refined and that defining and refining of values is done through spirituality the spirituality makes people better and does if science and spirituality come together then we can make the world better we make things better we make people better and we make the world better so i'll summarize what i spoke today we discuss on the uh, topic of can a rational person be spiritual and how can science and spirituality go together so the first thing i talked about is how rationality points to a reality beyond rationality that rationality is the idea of reason logic and especially in modern science it is codified through uh, through the language of math so if I mean the people just assume that if you are rational then you can't believe anything uh, spiritual like god or soul or such stuff but what is the basis for that claim that if if we have a if we equate rationality with atheism and or anti spirituality then the question comes up why should the universe have any rational order within it and why should our brain, our minds have the capacity to think rationally if we are just geared for survival then we don't need rational thinking about the abstract questions or the big questions of life for survival itself so <clears throat> so rationality has no explanation for why rationality exists and why rationality works why rationality exists means why why do our brains think rational why do our minds think rationally and why rationality works means why does nature follow the laws of math we discussed uh, nobel laureate's quote over that then i then i discussed about how god and rationality is god is not an explanation for the unexplainable oh science can't explain this therefore there we need god no god is the explanation for explainability why does why is science able to discover the laws of nature in terms of expression language of math because there is some higher intelligence which is underlying nature and has infused nature with with rationality which we discover so god is not an explanatory alternative to science is the explanatory foundation for science and there we discuss how god is not just one being among many beings he is not even the best of all beings 
He is the basis of all being. God is the existence who makes all existence possible. So to ask who created God is like asking who made a circle circular. That's the definition. So God, uh, to ask who created God is to presume that God exists within time. But God exists outside time. He creates time and he creates through time. So it's like a, a student, a child reading a Harry Potter novel and asking where is J.K. Rowling within it. So God is not, not like an undiscovered satellite around um, Jupiter that further research will find. God exists beyond nature, beyond the uh, fabric of space and time. Then we talked about uh, how there is below rational, there is irrational and above rational, there is transrational. And what is transrational? And we discussed about miracles. So there, are, there can be some special occasions when God intervenes into the working of nature and uh, suspends the laws, say, as happened when Krishna lifted the Govardhan hill. So miracles are not against science, they are above science. And the transrational is often what is the most inspirational in human beings. If we are purely rational creatures, we might, might never sacrifice our, risk our lives for somebody else's life. But when we do that, that is inspirational. So humans are, humanity needs to utilize rationality, but humanity is not restricted to rationality alone. In the last part, I talked about how science and spirituality can go together. There I talked about how the study of matter and the study of what matters. Science is the study of matter. Spirituality is the study of what matters. What matters means what is more important? What is less important? What are the values that should be guiding my life and my decision making? So uh, we discussed how science was mis misused by Nazi Germany for a horrendous scientific experiment that led to the killing of millions of people. And before that also, before the Holocaust also, there was so much sterilization and other terrible things were then in the idea of eugenics. So now that people should be killed so that a better race can evolve that is a that is a revolting idea but this revolting feeling the sense of repulsion that doesn't come from science alone for science the there is no inherent sanctity to any life or human life in particular also it is spirituality that gives sanctity to nature so even the we could just have a separate class on environmentalism also but the environment is infused with some sanctity because we understand that it is not just mechanical forces working around. It is God. God is nature. We are all having a spark of the divine. Every life is a spark of the divine. So by spiritual understanding, our values become defined and refined. And thus spiritual growth, spiritual advancement can make us better human beings. So science can make things better, spirituality can make people better, and together, science and spirituality can make the world better. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So there are a lot of questions here. So how can I develop my faith in God when my mind is full of doubt or dilemmas? Well, it is through discussions like these. Uh, raise specific questions, have the questions addressed, and by that, gradually our doubts can be dealt with. So, essentially, spirituality is not a matter of, of blind faith. It is a matter of, we use our reasoning to understand how to move forward in our lives. And I'll take only one question right now. So, students are, the government teaches that the students should be taught the theory of evolution, even in devoted on schools. So what should we do about that? We have to clearly understand what is the issue of concern over here. So with respect to evolution, there are there are three aspects to it. I have an article on the spiritual scientist and we can send you a link for this afterward. So but I'll try to explain it right now. See there is evolution as a observed phenomena. That means that living beings adapt to nature and that adaptation can be artificially done also as we can have small apples and big apples. So that living beings adapt to nature is a well-known fact. So that is an observed phenomena. 
and second is evolution as an inferred mechanism so an observed phenomena about changes inferred mechanism for all changes now from these observations we some some scientists use the word microevolution for this microevolution is we could say variation within species there is no need to dispute that at all we fully accept that in uh, in fact uh, one of the skills that krishna learns in the in his gurukul as described in the 10th canto of shrimad bhagavatam is is plant breeding how to create the most beautiful flowers the most delicious fruits by causing interbreeding between two so that living beings can adapt and improve that is something which is accepted so the first so most of the evidence for evolution that is presented today in the textbooks of evolution is at the first level it is observed phenomena and most of them are micro variations sorry it's called micro evolution that is their variation within species now second is uh, that evolution as a inferred mechanism for change of across species that means one species change into another through evolution now for this the evidence is significantly sketchy it's nowhere often most science, most evolutionary scientists give evidence for the first and presume that that evidence works for the second also so what is the second second is that evolution is a mechanism that has brought about the stunning variety of all life forms on earth so it's a inferred mechanism so now the jury for this is out it's not there are a significant minority of scientists also who oppose this but even this is not our major issue now we could conceivably say that that living beings can be endowed with abilities to adapt to their environments and if those adaptations happen then that doesn't deny the existence of a intelligence but it it actually points to the intelligence say which is even more significant it's like uh, so suppose you have a uh, say nowadays we have speech recognition softwares so with the speech recognition softwares they might come with a certain program module and if that's all they work with they may might work well but if that that ai module artificial intelligence module which is uses the the speech recognition for converting for example speech to text if that has self learning ability self learning means say if we train it you know, this is how i pronounce this word and it remembers that and starts using that so then that doesn't so self learning ability in a software program doesn't uh, re- doesn't in any way disprove the existence of the programmer in fact the self learning ability in a in a program testifies to the brilliance of the programmer you know to just create a one time uh, code which this is how it will work for all time that that is oh, great that is but to create self learning ability that requires even greater intelligence so that nature if nature has the capacity to evolve that in no way disproves the existence of god in so even the second aspect of nature now this we are not saying that evolution is true or evolution is false see we are not scientists and we cannot claim that we know science better than scientists that would be presumptuous so shila prabhupad was usually whenever he made some statements on evolution he was usually presented uh, evolution as atheistic but evolution intrinsically doesn't have to be atheistic evolution doesn't have to disprove god in fact evolution if the cap- if nature has the capacity to evolve that could mean that it it actually points to the brilliance of the designer of nature so again i'm not taking a position over here but i'm just talking about these three levels 
So first level, we don't have any problem at all with the observed phenomena. Second is as an inferred mechanism. Well, let science decide about that. But what the real issue is the third. The third is evolution as a all explaining ideology. Evolution as like a, it's almost like a magic wand which explains how life originated and how life spread across the world and how all life forms came about. Now this is an, this is not science. This is ideology. That ideology means if we go down to the evolution of consciousness, uh, the scientific, leave alone evidence for that, even the uh, theoretical possibility of how life may have evolved and how consciousness may have evolved. This is extremely speculative and absolutely no, uh, so many things will be required that it's uh, whether it can happen, whether it can happen is considered almost an impossibility. So the point is uh, the idea that evolution is an explanatory basis for all of existence. That is not science, that is an ideology. And our main concern is not with the first or even with the second. It is primarily with the third. That evolution as an all explaining ideology. So what was Srila Prabhupada's main concern? Prabhupada said life comes from life. And evolution itself as a change, as nature having the adaptability to modify itself uh, based on change circumstances, that does not disprove life comes from life. It is only when we go to the origins. And with respect to origins, origin of life, origin of consciousness, evolution doesn't have any coherent explanation at all. So we need to choose our battles carefully. Uh, that uh, we, we understand this three level conception and we have our main concern is not with the science. Now, if you read Shila Prabhupada's detailed conversation on Darwin, which is given in the Veda base, when he's presented evidence, you know, but we have this particular uh, fossil and Prabhupada gives various explanations for that. Prabhupada doesn't dismiss the evidence. So uh, we have to be very careful. What is our concern with evolution? It is when evolution is used as an all explaining magic wand, it becomes an ideological claim to justify materialism and atheism and to reject God. That is our concern. So we need to, we need to understand clearly what is the issue of concern and address it appropriately. Now, all the other questions are also important and uh, I will answer these on my website and we will before the next session, uh, we will send you the answers on our WhatsApp group. Thank you. Hare Krishna.